Good evening. I'm Mark Zilberman, and it's my honor to serve as board chair of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. While 2020 was a year of unexpected challenges, I can't begin to tell you how proud I am that the museum has overcome every one of them. From closing down our newly opened museum only six months after the grand opening, to learning how to create and execute virtual programs for the community and students, I have never been more impressed with our staff and their dedication to educating the next generation of upstanders, even during a pandemic. Equally impressive is the devotion displayed by my fellow board members, museum members, teachers, corporate sponsors, individual and foundation donors, and our dedicated volunteers. Thank you for keeping our mission top of mind. From March to December of 2020, thanks to your support, the museum hosted 383 virtual programs that reached 28,336 people. This included students, teachers, community members, professionals from all different industries. We even had people tuning in from Mexico and New Zealand. As impressive as that is, I'm even more excited to share that this year, we have been enjoying a steady increase in walk-in visitors, many of whom are seeing our new home for the first time and are eager to tell others about their experience. When visitors finish a tour through our museum, they leave with a renewed sense of purpose to be an upstander in their community. We teach them to be part of the solution in stopping anti-Semitism, racism, hate speech, prejudice towards any group, most recently our Asian American citizens, and other crimes rooted in hatred and bigotry. We are making an impact at every level of society, and it's only possible because of you and your support. In 2021, we invite you to take advantage of all we have to offer, from our own events to partner programs to member exclusives, there is something for everyone and we encourage you to invite others to be a part of our museum family. Once again, I want to say thank you. You are the foundation of this museum. Through your steadfast support, you show us and the world what it means to be upstanders. And for that, I'm eternally grateful and very hopeful for what the rest of this year will bring. Thank you. Good evening, everyone and welcome to the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum's 2021 Spring Fundraiser event. I am Kimberly Ross. And I am Jana Minskowski. As co-chairs of the Spring Fundraiser for the past four years, we were sad and disappointed when we made the difficult decision to cancel last year's event. Even though we are virtual, we are so excited to be with all of you tonight. At a time when hate crimes are on the rise in our country, the museum's work reminds us to look to the past in order to inform our future. As the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor, I feel a personal responsibility to promote the museum's important mission, to teach the history of the Holocaust and to advance human rights, to combat prejudice, hatred, and indifference. This is why we love being a part of the Spring Fundraiser so much. For us, it is a friendraiser an easy way to introduce friends and family to the museum's mission through the arts. Another reason we love this event is the opportunity to work with such amazing people, including Mary Pat Higgins, Carrie Lai, Barbara Acuna Taylor, and the rest of the incredible museum team. Yana and I could not do this alone. We wanna also take this time to thank our amazing host committee for sharing their excitement about this event by inviting many of you to be with us tonight. To the incredible honorary co-chairs and the honorary committee members, thank you for all that you do for the museum and for the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. We are honored to feature the musicians from the symphony as part of tonight's event. And to each of you, our generous sponsors and supporters, thanks to your generous support, we raise critical funding to sustain the museum's important year-round work. Thank you so very much. Past spring events have included partnerships with the AT&T Performing Arts Center for the Broadway production of Cabaret, 
and with the Eisman Center for the off-Broadway production of Driving Miss Daisy. Tonight's program, Music in the Camps, was uniquely conceived. The Dimensions and Testimony Theater from the USC Shoah Foundation is an incredible holographic experience housed in the museum. Visitors can sit across from a Holocaust survivor and ask them questions about their life and survival. Inspired from a Dimensions and Testimony session with Holocaust survivor Anita Lasker Walfish, who was a cellist in the all-female orchestra in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Music in the Camps will share this incredible facet of the Holocaust history through the powerful voices of survivor testimonies. To tell us a little more about tonight's featured film is Mary Pat Higgins, President and CEO. We hope you were inspired by the program as much as we were in producing it. Thank you again for generously supporting the mission and the work of the museum and for being with us tonight. Good evening. I'm Mary Pat Higgins, President and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Thank you, Yana and Kimberly, for chairing this event for the third year in a row. We are so fortunate to have your excellent leadership, and we are thankful for your committee's unwavering dedication to our mission to teach the history of the Holocaust and advance human rights to combat prejudice, hatred, and indifference. I also want to thank our honorary co-chairs and honorary committee members for making this event such a success. And to each of you, our generous sponsors and supporters, we couldn't do what we do without you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. We are thrilled this year to have talented musicians from the Dallas Symphony Orchestra featured in our documentary film, Music in the Camps. This original commissioned documentary brings to light a lesser known and often undiscussed piece of history that there was indeed music in the camps during the Holocaust. Music is complex. It can bring you back to a memory from your childhood. It can bring you joy in times of exuberance. Music can haunt us, but it can also heal us in times of despair. Just as music itself can be complex, so too was the history of music in the camps. Through survivor testimony, we will show how music took on many roles in the camp. Tragically, music was sometimes used as a form of exploitation to take advantage of already imprisoned and tortured Jews. At other times, it served as a soothing comfort and inspiration, even a means of resistance. But most importantly, it was cherished among prisoners and remembered among survivors to this day as a form of resilience and hope. Unfortunately, humanity still has not learned the lessons of the past. All you have to do is look at the news to see that bigotry and hatred are very much alive. When we look back at 2020 and see the same cycle repeating itself in 2021, we see a constant reminder of what happens when bigotry and hatred go unchecked, when everyday people stand by and do nothing instead of choosing to be upstanders. Fortunately, we know that hatred is learned and as such, it can be unlearned. At the museum, we are putting words into action by educating the world about the critical role upstanders play in bringing hatred, bigotry, and indifference to an end. Because of your support, we are bringing harmony back into the discord, just as our survivors, on whose shoulders we stand, have been doing for decades. They found the courage to speak, and so can we. Each one of us can make a difference in the world, but together we can change the world. By the 1930s, frustration, fear, and political unrest were at an all-time high in Germany. President Hindenburg appointed Adolf Hitler as chancellor. Neither the president nor the non-Nazi cabinet trusted Hitler, but they were more afraid of political violence. Over the next 100 days, Hitler used fear tactics and manipulated events to dismantle German democracy. 
He used the Reichstag fire as an opportunity to enact martial law, suspending civil rights and freedoms. In August 1934, President Hindenburg died. He was the last check on Hitler's power. Now both chancellor and president, Hitler became the dictator of Germany and declared himself Fuhrer. The Nazi government started its merciless war against Germany's Jews, marginalizing them through the creation of hundreds of laws and decrees that increasingly restricted their everyday lives and rights, blaming them for virtually all of the nation's economic and political woes. German Jews lost their rights and freedoms as citizens. They lost their jobs. They lost their homes. With the start of World War II, the Nazis needed to cleanse Jews, not only from Germany, but also from the lands they conquered in Eastern Europe. They established ghettos to segregate, isolate, and quarantine the Jews. In the ghettos, Jews were forced to endure harsh living conditions, including hard labor, overcrowded quarters, horrendous sanitation, and a shortage of food and clean water, resulting in rampant illness, starvation, and death. From the ghettos, Jews were deported to the six death camps in occupied Poland. Death was everywhere. Some were able to survive. Others were not. Thousands of amateur and professional Jewish musicians were unprepared for what they were about to face in the Holocaust, but they were also uniquely equipped to supply the much needed hope and strength for themselves and for their fellow prisoners. Well, in the beginning it was secret. The Germans later got to know about it, but they tolerated it. They did not prosecute or do anything. I assume their line was that as long as the Unrat exists and as long as people work, then uh, they should have some uh, release, some uh, entertainment. Even though uh, living in all this poverty with all the diseases and all that, there was theater performed. There were musicians playing. There were songs written in the Warsaw Ghetto. The Vilna Ghetto tried very hard to have a theater, to have a Philharmonic Orchestra, to, um, to do things for the soul. Aside from theatrical or choral productions, many artists across ghettos shared songs that described their experiences and expressed their frustrations. Every song that they wrote in the ghetto it had something to do with the uh, with survival, and it had to do with the murder, that the whole world was standing outside, and nobody, if you can say it in English, give a damn about you. And other songs were written with a lot of hope. We will go out, we will break the gates, we will go out from the ghettos, we will start our life all over again. Different from other camps and ghettos, Theresienstadt was disguised as a spa town and presented as a model ghetto by the Nazis. It was, in fact, a ghetto, a concentration camp, and a transit camp. Famous Jewish musicians, artists, and academics, as well as ordinary Jews, were imprisoned there. The Nazis hid their true intentions. That time, the trains were coming already inside the ghetto. 
Our teacher was a music teacher. She was Zionist. She organized a group of children, and this group was called, in Hebrew, Yat Tomechet. It means helping hand. They let us go to the train when some transport would come and to help to carry for some old people their luggage. They came from Germany uh, under the notion that they are going into a spa, that they will be looked after, they will live in a hotel. They paid a lot of money in Germany to be in a uh, Carlsbad, a spa. And here we come, you know, not the best dressed children. So when we came, they didn't like us at all. They were yelling at us. They thought that we are stealing, you know, their stuff. They brought in suitcases with evening dresses and long gloves and hats with feathers and all that. And of course, these people were dying 200 a day. They didn't know what was waiting for them. Like other ghettos and camps, Theresienstadt was a place of filth, hunger, and disease. So many prisoners died from illness and starvation that the Nazis provided it with its own crematorium to dispose of the bodies. Even so, the artistic community rallied with an outpouring of creative expression, comforting and supporting the entire community. The immense talent within Theresienstadt resulted in a thriving cultural life within its walls. All these uh, great artists, which I had known as international artists and as artists in Berlin, were there and performed their own, their life's work. Those few hours, or whatever time we had, you forgot. You forgot that, you know, the misery, you forgot that fear of the tomorrow, which may end up in gas or whatever. We, you heard the music, you, were, you heard what the uh, composer were telling you, or what the interpreter was trying to, to give you. And these were hours of pure uh, joy, as much as you can call joy in, in camp. I had to work and care for others. I could forget about my own troubles. That's where the singing came in. That's where the conducting services came in with choir. Uh, we went to the uh, sick rooms. The air was non-breathable, but we sang and uh, made us feel important. In concentration camps, the need for distraction and support was no different than in the ghettos, but expressing cultural life was much more dangerous. For this reason, Jews supported each other with music in secret, often in the dead of night. In the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in the Sonderlager, a few Zionist youth did go from barak to barak, came into ours, and in the darkness they sat down and started to sing Hanukkah songs. We had the neighboring barrack with the Czechs, and the Czechs were great musicians. One of them, Alfonso Weisa, he transcribed Smetana's opera, The Kiss, for male voices only from memory. And then he performed with his singers in the Czech barracks. He performed the kiss from the beginning to the end. So I have to live here. And now I'm going to make that life as livable as possible. You cannot replace a great musical line, what it does to you, by anything else. That this is not something special which you do on certain occasions, but it is part of, of the, the need for something which nothing else can fill it but the great, um, the great expressions of music. In Dachau, with the help of prisoners who were professional instrument makers, Herbert Zipper covertly built instruments for prisoner musicians. They held secret concerts in the latrine on Sundays for up to 40 inmates at a time. So we played a short program of 15 minutes all afternoon. It was the only time you could do it, Sunday afternoon. Your so-called free time. We had at least 30 or 40 excellent musicians who were in jail there two or three first-rate music uh, instrument makers, but we could make some things that sounded like music. Some Jews sang to endure their daily ordeal, hoping to escape the horrors of reality in a moment of song. And that, to me, is my saving grace for many reasons. First, first of all, when I sang, I forgot where I was. 
I got involved with the song I was singing. And I think I made the other inmates kind of happy for that half hour that I was doing. This meant so much for everybody that music really made us forget all the troubles that we had that time. Unfortunately, the Nazis cruelly exploited Jewish musicians for their own purposes. I thought I'm hallucinating because I heard as if I heard the Eine Kleine Nachtmusik from Mozart being played. I thought, well, it's, this is, I'm hallucinating in this hell. There can't possibly be, I mean, any, uh, Mozart music. There were bands in practically every concentration camp. Obviously, the Germans can't do a damn thing. Well, let's put it, the Nazis can't do a damn thing without music. We had roll calls in the morning and in the evening, and the band played German marches and whatever else uh, was necessary. They were all prisoners, but that was their job. The daily task of counting thousands of prisoners as they left for work detail and returned in the evening was daunting. The Nazis decided that having prisoners march out of camp in rows of five deep would simplify the process, but a suitable pace was not always easy for prisoners to maintain. Camp orchestras performed German march music to facilitate the proper tempo. We went by to work by orchestra, we came home by orchestra, people were tortured by orchestra, everything by the best musicians. Somehow, when I got into the camp, I must have mentioned that I am a musician. So, I was requested to join the band in Birkenau. There, I got a violin in my hand, and I had to play. This girl who was um, processing me asked me, well, what, well, how's the war going and where do you come from and what did you do before the war? And like a fool, I said, I used to play the cello and I thought it was a crazy thing to say. What importance can that have in Auschwitz? And then the extraordinary thing happened. She said, oh, that's fantastic. We need a cello because we have an orchestra here and we haven't got any bass instruments. I got dressed a little bit better. It was one of the privileges and we had to play in the morning for the commandos, which are the working teams, leaving the camp and in the evening when they came back. The rest of the day we had to work, but there were certain moments where we had to entertain the SS. Like, for instance, we had to be always prepared for some Germans to come in and ask for something. We played light music, you know, it wasn't very serious music. Though many camps had orchestras, some commandants grew particularly proud of their ensembles and began utilizing them in creative ways to gain status among their fellow officers. He had special uniforms made for these guys and took them on gigs to different concentration camps around Auschwitz to show off what he had there. It, it is absolutely inane when you, when you talk about this, but this actually took place. One commandant was a village musician, so he wanted music. So he said, are there musicians here? Hey, musicians. We had the top members of the Berlin Philharmonic in our group. He built a platform in the, in the camp, and on a Sunday, every second Sunday we had off, there he was running around, excited like it was his event, you know? And we were standing in columns, at ease, and he brought in people from the village. His officers came in with girlfriends, with wives, women dressed in summer dresses with wide brimmed hats. I mean, a sight we hadn't seen. And then he gave a signal to the orchestra, play Kol Nidre. <laughs> and they played Kol Nidre and we stood and we cried and they played Kol Nidre. So popular was the idea of having a camp orchestra among the commandants that the women's camp in Auschwitz-Birkenau put together its own collection of musicians. You mustn't think in terms of proper orchestra. I mean, there were people, mandolins and uh, guitars and a few violins and a couple of accordions, that sort of thing. Meanwhile, the Nazis had imprisoned Alma Rosé, the niece of Gustav Mahler and a professional violinist in her own right. While in the Auschwitz hospital, she demanded to play the violin as a last request. Stunned at her performance, the Commandant immediately put Rosé in charge of the women's orchestra. While we were rehearsing one day, we were ready to rehearse, 
Uh, and uh, suddenly, a Nazi comes in, one of the big ones, the names you know there, and, was, and brings this, uh, this lady, that Nazi, told her, play something for us, and she stood up and she played. We were all with her mouth open, she knew it by heart, and she played so well, they met her the conductor. When you have a good conductor, you play well. They used to call us the Damen vom Orchester, you know, we were the, the ladies. We were better dressed, you know, we were the showpiece, a bit like Theresienstadt, not quite as uh, pronounced, but you know, when people came to the camp to have a look, what is it like in Auschwitz, <laughs> they would come to us. Aside from playing the morning marches and for individual SS officers, orchestras had to perform in appalling and dehumanizing conditions as well. They had such nerve. Oh boy, did they know how to do it. We were greeted by a band. We were greeted by a band. We did not shed a tear before them. We were numb. And suddenly, as if a, a conductor had stood up there and said, cry. <laughs> we passed an orchestra with the uh, conductor in an impeccable uniform, with white gloves, conducting Beethoven. I think it was Beethoven. And these people with shaven heads and in striped uniforms, playing music. And then on the other side, we saw three chimneys with black spots. I mean, I was asked at an interview once, how did you know there were gas chambers in Auschwitz? <laughs> I mean, it was there, you could see it. You could see it. You could see the smoke. You could hear it. You could see the people walking past. And it was a matter of time when we are going to go in there. I mean, that was the, uh, that was the thing. Are we still alive today? Well, tomorrow we may be smoking, you know, and smoke. The barbarism. Can you imagine killing people and music playing? We were invited to play the crematories. We played in the facilities where other people were gassed, and it was told to us, well, aren't you a bit afraid in there? And the only thing which kept us not being too afraid to, to play was that they were with us in there, the SS guys. If we would have been alone, I don't know what we would have done. That's a contrast. You entertain, but you're gonna starve and you're gonna die. We can kill you any second. But then there was one period in Theresienstadt, which was 1943. Perhaps the pinnacle of Nazi exploitation was the staging of the Theresienstadt ghetto for a visit by the International Red Cross and the subsequent production of a propaganda film to show the world how well they were treating the Jews. They began to realize that this might be an asset in their policy of proclaiming the Theresienstadt ghetto as a model. And that's when the whole ghetto was in an uproar for about four to six weeks. They had to make everything nice and make a Potemkin village. In preparation for the visit, the Nazis had to deal with the severe overcrowding of the ghetto. In the span of three days, just over a month before the visit, more than 7,500 Jews were deported to Auschwitz. We had to clean the ghetto and it was all, and we had to play. And the German wanted to, to show to the world how human they are with Jews. We were hoping that the Red Cross will see that something is wrong, that uh, this is not a group of people entertaining or, or what, but uh, I think our feeling was that they didn't get it. They saw what the Nazis wanted them to see. They did the children's opera, Brunjeba, which was one of the most famous ghetto operas. They moved us to a big theater place and everybody was busy. They brought instruments to have orchestras and they made a beautiful, uh, you know, lighting what never, we never had.
the end is like if we if we unite and if we stick to the truth and they are not afraid, we are going to to overcome anything. The victory song was that we overcame Hitler. And we sang that with such an energy. It was part of the resistance against the Germans. We wanted to show them that we will one day win this war. After the Red Cross visit, and with the filming complete, the Nazis deported many of the Jews who had participated in the two projects to Auschwitz. This included nearly all of the children. And I realized one, something very important, very important, that everybody's human, but not everybody's humane. As time passed, Jews relied on music in a variety of public and private ways to resist both the Nazis and the pervading atmosphere of despair. We had to perform, and I arranged for my brother and myself a medley of German songs, which we performed in front of those Nazis sitting right in front of us and the dogs staring at us. I failed not to include a song, a German song, which in effect said, my thoughts are free, they are my own. You can't shoot me, you can't shoot my spirit. And this I sang straight into their faces. Now in the last camp in Blechhammer, we put a, a show on. And the SS will be there, the first, the first four row, they were there, we'll, we'll do things for them. And I sang a song, I remember in Yiddish, which means I'm going home. I don't want to be, I don't want to be here. I want to be with my Jewish people. That's what I was singing in Yiddish. And Yiddish is very close to German. I'm sure they understood what I was singing. The whole song had, had its own life without, without me. I just wrote it for the people, some kind of, of resistance, sometimes to give them hope. And if things begin to arouse the imagination of people, if, whatever it is, they begin to have their own life. Perhaps the most moving example of Jewish defiance was a powerful act that continues to resonate, the staging of Verdi's Requiem at Theresienstadt. Renowned Czech composer and conductor Raphael Schachter understood his fellow prisoner's need for emotional, psychological, and spiritual perseverance. Schachter used his talents to conduct Verdi's Requiem, a choral performance to lament the dead and to warn of impending judgment for the wicked. In his mind, he transformed it from the Mass for the Dead into Mass for the Dead Nazis. And he couldn't tell them in German, so he thought if he can sing it in Latin, he may get away with it. The performance was transformational, filling all who watched it with hope. Yet the day following their initial performance, most of Schachter's choir was deported to Auschwitz. Some suggested moving on from the Requiem, but Schachter was defiant. He rebuilt the choir and continued to conduct. This room became the shell or the, uh, the, the protective walls of something good, something uh, meaningful, something healing, and something helping, and something that showed everyone who was really listening, that Rafi had put all of us, the singers and the audience, into another world. This was not the world with the Nazis. This was our world. The choir was equally inspired and determined, fully embracing the message of the opera and Schachter's intent of leading this uprising through the power of music. It is the reason why we are calling the culture in Terezin as culture resistance. It has given us a resistance against our fate. Ultimately, with a diminished choir of only 60, Schachter led a performance for the visit of the International Red Cross. This was to be their last performance, as a few months later, Schachter himself was deported to Auschwitz. Without Rafi, it wouldn't have happened. 
we proved beyond the shadow of any doubt that yes, they have our bodies. Yes, we have no more names, we have numbers, but they don't have our soul, our mind, our being, our what, what we are cannot be taken away. Also, it won't be taken away at the moment we are shot. Lev Aronson was a renowned European concert cellist when Germany invaded Riga, Latvia in 1941. Upon his arrest, the Nazis confiscated his beloved cellos. In order to save his life, Aronson identified himself not as a musician, but as a welder. When placed in an impossible situation that would almost certainly result in his death, Aronson found an unexpectedly practical means of secretly utilizing music to ensure his survival. And they took us five people out one day, and the two Germans came out and said, you have to load up this track. If you don't do that, within one hour, you'll all be shot and buried in this coal. You don't have a watch. You don't know what is an hour anymore. What do you know what is an hour? How long is an hour? And in my mind, I was singing a cello concerto. But when it was over, it was, I knew that it was 20 minutes. 20 minutes, the next concerto, St. Sans concerto, let's go. Work, and St. Sans concerto went in my mind. And then another concerto went in my mind. And so, in an hour, it was done. It was three concerti, I had 20 minutes a piece. As powerful as music was in helping prisoners resist the Nazi-imposed terrors of the camps and ghettos, it was perhaps even more vital as a source of inner strength, providing the resilience needed to persevere. My mother was sent away. This was the lowest moment of my life. I, I couldn't eat, I couldn't drink, I couldn't sleep. And I remember I went in the street, I know I would find the place where it happened. This voice said to me, now you alone can help yourself. And in the next moment, the 24th at Jules by Chopin, I came home, I sat to the piano and I played for hours and hours and hours and it helped me. Slowly, slowly, I got again physical and mental force. In the end, the work that set these prisoners free was not the cruel hard labor required by the Nazis, but the labors of love and support expressed through music and song shared with fellow prisoners in the ghettos and camps. Suddenly, they heard some human words, some human expression of excellence, and they began to understand it. And this excellence really made them feel also like human beings again. These people in this terrible, undescribable situation, without eating, ill, this was their food. They didn't die because they got this food. Not bread and not butter and nothing. This food, culture, saved the life of some of these people. Amazing. At the end of the war, camps and ghettos were liberated by Allied forces. Without a family or a country to go home to, Jewish survivors were faced with another layer of pain and suffering on their road to recovery. Though music was vital in helping prisoners endure the camps, we cannot help but reflect on the souls we lost and the beauty they were never allowed to share. How many composers' pens fell silent to the gas chambers? How many musicians who should have graced stages across the globe were relegated instead to platforms at the camps and death? Their notes may have fallen silent, but the beauty of their spirits remains. And yet, what of the songs and music written during these dark years? Many of the composers of Theresienstadt were deported to their deaths, but they left behind a handful of compositions with friends and loved ones. The songs of the Vilna, Riga, Warsaw, and other ghettos were collected and recorded decades ago, but will future generations still listen?
But this is a thing of the past, even with all those songs, you know. Nobody will remember them anymore. Because nobody will buy them anymore, too. There are still a few survivors left, but with times passing by another 20 years, 15 years, nobody will be left to sing the songs. I'd like to actually just sing it quietly so we have it on record. Dort nicht weit, dort wie der Umschlagplatz dort steigt, dort wie man stirbt sich in der Brei, in die Waggonen. Mir sein in jeden bei dem Drot, arum dem Stechel dicken Drot. Ich will heim und ich kann nicht gehen, weil verblockt sein in mir von die Räuber. Die Gedanken sind frei, wer kann sie erraten? Sie fliegen vorbei wie nächtliche Schatten. Kein Mensch kann sie wissen, kein Jäger erschießen. Es bleibt dabei, die Gedanken. Da hanken sind frei. Zwei Jahre sind schon vergangen, in Ghetto schrecklicher Klagen. Es ist noch weit, die gute Zeit, und aus mir wollen sein befreit. Weil noch ein Ess von Himmel kann helfen uns erzählen. Aber, sorry. Komm's. Sog nicht keim las de geis den letzten Weg. Hot himlen bleien er verstellen bläue Teig. Kulmen wird noch unser eus gebänkte Schuh. Svet ei poig son unser Trump, mir senen du. Von grüne Palmelen bis Weidenland vom Schnee. Wir kommen nun mit unser Pein und unser Weh. Und wo gefallen ist ein Spritz von unser Blut? Spots verdor unter Gewohre unter Mut.
music, you know, has played a great part in my survival. But sometimes there were songs that improved you not giving up. We have pain and other things, but there's always hope and we still are here. Is that okay?